What's up everyone? Before we get things started today, I wanted to let you know that Into the Fray is back. That's right, Ironclad's flagship series that shows you behind the scenes of how we do what we do is here to stay. Check out a sneak peek here. We are done with the first scene, which was the cell block scene. And now we're gonna do the scene where two guards transport James Reese when I look at any project, I always try to envision how it will be in its final state, but I also try to think about who I'm working with in the crew. Uh, the good news is, is the crew for this is all an ironclad team and we're so well oiled. This was one of those ones that we really just had fun as a group with. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. North Koreans face a level of physical and digital isolation and oppression that is almost, if not unprecedented, anywhere else in the world. No one is allowed to leave the country without the government's permission. Successfully fleeing North Korea requires a 3,000-mile journey, unless you want to risk your life trying to cross from north to south over the DMZ. China arrests any North Korean refugees and sends them back to North Korea, where they face extreme punishments such as beatings, forced labor, torture, and sentences to internment camps. In addition to the difficulty of the journey, an estimated 60% of women who escape North Korea are sold into sex trafficking. My guest today is Sokil Park. He's an activist helping North Korean defectors. So Kiel has previously worked for the South Korean government, the United Nations, and served as a consultant for the independent diplomat. He currently serves as the South Korea country director for liberty in North Korea, also known as LINK, where he is responsible for research and global media outreach. LINK focuses on the escape and resettlement of North Korean refugees trying to flee the country. So Kiel works primarily with policymakers to reframe North Korea by focusing on social change. What is the mission statement for Liberty in North Korea? What does the organization exist to do? So it's the name of our organization, right? That's our vision, Liberty in North Korea, a freedom for all North Korean women, men, and children. Um, it's, it feels very far away. And I think there's some people it may feel impossible. So I think there's some, to some of my North Korean friends, it may feel impossible, but, um, we think that it can happen. It can happen in our lifetime and we want to help all North Korean people achieve that freedom. Can you unpack for me a little bit what life is actually like for people currently living in North Korea? I know that there's obviously the physical separation, but there's also a huge degree of electronic isolation as well. And I'm, I'm curious to what degree that occurs. And I'm also fascinated to know if they realize, like the current uh, citizens of North Korea, do they even realize the level of isolation that is being forced upon them? Yeah, those are good questions. Um, the isolation is really unparalleled compared to any other country in the world. Uh, North Koreans, you know, some of them get to travel and maybe go to China or some other third countries, but it is hundred percent exclusively for economic reasons, right? It's for work, business, um, you know, trade, those kind of things. There's no, you know, people, North Koreans talk about imagining maybe one, one day getting on a plane and being able to visit other countries. They have a sense that like, you know, maybe other people in other countries are able to do that. Um, for the vast majority of North Koreans, that's a dream. It's a little bit like, you know, for us, maybe imagining getting in a spaceship and going to space. It's like, you know, that some people do that, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and the, the digital isolation as well, North Koreans can not make even phone calls to the outside world. 
Uh, and of course, the internet basically almost doesn't exist in North Korea. Um, and where it does exist, it's extremely tightly controlled. Uh, so there are some universities that have some access, but you have to submit like a, an official request with an official kind of purpose of why you want to use the internet. And then you get a small amount of time to do it and you're, you're being monitored, you know, digitally and even essentially physically while you do that. Um, you know, one thing that kind of blew my mind is I heard from a North Korean diplomat who defected to South Korea. But even North Korean diplomats, you know, people that are trusted by the North Korean government to go and work in embassies in Europe and Africa and around the world, when they're in Pyongyang, they don't get to use the internet while they're there either. In the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in building in Pyongyang, um, they don't even have free access to like their own email address, their you know their own emails, that kind of thing. This is the, this is the level of. Uh, control and repression of the internet and any kind of contact with the outside world and so on. The North Korean people are finding ways to get around that. There are, for instance, Chinese mobile phones, smartphones that get smuggled in. And if you're on the North Korean side of the border, but close enough to China, you're within range of the Chinese mobile phone mass, mass towers. And people use the geography, right? They go up a mountain, they try and get some signal. Then you might be able to receive a... Uh, a message, right? A voice message uh, from somebody who's gone to South Korea, um, a photograph, you know, being being able to be in some kind of contact. People also smuggle media in from the outside world using micro SD cards, for instance. You know, you can imagine if a North Korean person gets to go to China and gets to use the internet there and can download, you know, South Korean films, you know, dramas, music, uh, you know, ebooks, even websites, and so on. You can imagine how much you can put on a micro SD card these days. Oh, yeah. And then it's pretty hard for the North Korean authorities to find a micro SD card. You know, if somebody's coming back in on the train, there's all sorts of places that they could hide that. And then they, you know, they have it in North Korea, and then they, a lot of people will share it with family and friends. And so there's kind of a network of, distribution of foreign media smuggled you know illegal media inside the country so people are, are able to find ways around these restrictions but recently it has become even more dangerous as the north korean government has increased the punishments and, and enacted more laws where for instance if you are caught sharing south korean dramas the kind of stuff that we might watch on netflix uh, if you share that using a usb drive in north korea then you could be executed for that. And, th and there have been, you know, reports of public executions for the so-called crime of sharing foreign media. So the North Korean government, I think it's fair to say, is trying to have complete and totalitarian control over information to their citizens. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, probably more so than any other authoritarian government in human history. And, you know, in a way, you can give credit to them because they understand the power of culture and information and that maintaining their kind of system is difficult, right? They've seen over the last 70 years, many dictatorships fail and many dictatorships running on you know, communist or socialist ideological lines, they've seen them fail. And their analysis is that in East Germany, in Romania, you know, in the communist bloc, at the end of the Cold War, those countries failed, uh, you know, in large part because of the ideological failure, because they failed to prevent, uh, from their perspective, a kind of cultural infiltration of alternative ideas, you know, uh, imagery, narratives, all of these kind of things. We understand the importance of not just heavy investment into for want of a better word, indoctrinating the population with their own narratives and ideas and their stories about their own government and leadership and the outside world. You know, what is America like? What is South Korea like? All these kind of uh, propaganda, basically. But also on keeping out alternative, contradicting information and narratives and, and stories and so on. So... Safe to say, 
government oppression exists throughout the country. What other kind of living conditions and uh, challenges do the people of North Korea face just on that day to day beyond just the government oppression in and of itself? Yeah. Um, you know, one, one thing to bear in mind is that North Korea is a country. It's a country of 25 million people and people live different lives, right? There is a diversity of lived experience there. Um, there are relatively richer people uh, who have better conditions, especially in Pyongyang and some of the major cities. At the same time, not everybody in Pyongyang is rich, just like not everybody in New York or London is rich, right? There's a lot of poverty there. There's a lot of poverty across the country, especially in uh, rural areas. Um, it's crazy to think living in South Korea that so close to here, there are people and whole communities struggling for food, especially during the pandemic. And there have been multiple credible reports of deaths from starvation happening again amongst North Korean people in the last three years, three years or so, you know, during the pandemic. Um, and the, you know, North Korea, in a way, has become even more North Korea, even more closed, even more repressive. Life has become even harder for North Korean people. So there are, unfortunately, people that struggle for food, struggle to get enough calories in the day. Um, you know, there's, there's simple things, uh, things that might seem simple, like North Koreans, when they come to South Korea, often one of the things is just uh, bathrooms and having hot running water in your house and, and just, you know, appreciating that. Um, of course, you know, the internet and being able to type something into a computer and then get any kind of information or media that you could imagine. Um, you know, the, the freedoms as well, right? Having a South, you know, coming here and then having a South Korean passport and being able to travel anywhere in the world, pretty much apart from, I guess, back home to North Korea, um, you know, getting used to those kind of things. And so that, that, the, the, uh, the mirror image of that is what life is like in North Korea, even to travel within your province from one city or village to a different part of your province, you need official permission. And that means there are checkpoints and people are monitoring reasons for travel and so on. And realistically, you need to bribe, you need to, you know, you need to pay bribes to get through checkpoints or to get, you know, the kind of like having a visa to, you know, needing a visa to go from, you know, uh, Virginia to, you know, into DC or something like that. Ladies and gentlemen, today's episode of Change Agents is brought to you by Ketone IQ. You may be asking yourself, what is Ketone IQ? Well, the answer is that it's brain fuel. It is a clean energy boost without the sugar or caffeine. When should you use it? Well, the answer to that is kind of anytime that you want to re-energize. I use it in the morning before I sit down to have a podcast episode. And what I'll tell you is it provides me the energy and clarity that caffeine does, a coffee per se, but it lasts a lot longer. And I don't feel, it's not that I feel a crash with caffeine, but I don't feel the let off like I do with caffeine. It lasts a lot longer. It's a very sustained energy state. It gives me very good clarity of focus. Um, and a lot of things that come with that, better memory, better word recall, all the things that I'm trying to do when I'm hosting a podcast episode. Cool thing about Ketone IQ is you can find it a couple places. One, if you live in a place that has a grocery chain called Sprouts, you can find that nationwide. Um, or you can find Ketone IQ at hvmn.com. I'm going to say that one more time. Hotel Victor Mike November .com. If you visit hvmn.com and you use the promo code Andy at checkout, you're going to save 20%. Again, that is hvmn.com. Promo code Andy to get yourself a clean energy boost without sugar or caffeine. You know, listening to you talk about somebody coming across the border, because I definitely want to dive into the defection and, and the routes and the reasons and the challenges associated with that, because it ties directly into liberty in North Korea and what you do. But as you were talking about somebody coming to South Korea and getting a passport, 
you know, and being able to travel anywhere they want to. Do you think that the average North Korean citizen has even an idea of the size and scope of the world and what most other people take for granted in their ease of travel or just the volume of information that may be out there or the volume of experiences of the corner? Well, tough, tough to go to the corner of a circle, but you know, for those of us who believe that the earth is round, the almost un, unimaginable lengths that you can go to to travel. Do you think they have any idea of that? Uh, yeah, I think that they do, right? Um, I mean, North Koreans, they, you know, they definitely have a sense of the world. Um, you know, people learn basic geography. Um, they know, you know, they know what the world looks like. Uh, they know, you know, kind of where North Korea and where the Korean Peninsula is in the world and, and how big it is. And people, you know, people have that kind of education. And they have also exposure through different kinds of media uh, to, you know, the fact that there are different people and, you know, people look different around the world and people you know, speak with different languages and all that kind of stuff. So I think that a lot of the basics are there. Um, but if you've, if you've not used the internet, then you might have a sense, you might have a conceptual understanding of the internet. Um, but it may be, you know, like pretty like way off in terms of like how we actually use the internet today yeah. and what the actual possibilities are. Um, you you know, know. one, one story that sticks with me is even just using a computer. Um, a lot of North Koreans have not used the computer in North Korea. Increasingly people are able to have maybe, you know, a, sec a secondhand Chinese laptop that, you know, coming to the country and so on but people don't like uh often use computers in school for instance there's often like unimaginable in south korea or the united states probably and so one of my friends actually describes how in her class they weren't able to use an actual computer so she drew out the whole keyboard on a piece of paper and she was just like pressing on the paper on the different keys that she'd drawn in order to kind of practice like using a computer so people are learning and kind of experiencing that way but then you know that's that's totally different to the world that we live in right and people then see uh in smuggled media how south koreans a lot of them seem to that all of their work is just pressing buttons on a computer right moving a mouse pressing buttons on a computer having a meeting with colleagues and people look at that and that even seems, you know, really impressive and um, even like a fantasy for a lot of North Koreans who they have to use, you know, their physical strength to work, right? It's a lot of manual labor or it's, it's shifting goods and selling them, you know, in person. It's not doing stuff online and doing stuff on computers. Yeah. Yeah, having an understanding of where your country is in the world, but yet never having the opportunity to see the rest of the world with your eyes is quite jarring. You may, you may understand from a geographical perspective, but you certainly don't understand from a cultural perspective until you can immerse yourself in it. And, and also, I guess, you know, the, the comparison point as well, right? Like, um, one of the things that North Koreans kind of learn after they leave North Korea is how unique North Korea is. That they, they understood, you know, probably that North Korea is different to China and different to South Korea, but maybe not fully you know, that North, the, the, the conditions in North Korea don't really exist in other countries. Yeah. And the way that North Korea is seen from the outside world, you know, these are things that a lot of people in North Korea would, would not really have a very good grasp on unless they had, you know, some kind of international exposure. For those that go on that you know, intellectual and emotional journey and arrive at the decision where they, you know, they're going to, Fortune favors the bold to a degree, and they are going to go and try to leave North Korea. What options are actually available for them? So, unfortunately, this is something that's changed a lot with the pandemic and during the pandemic, um, where it's become much more difficult to escape from North Korea. And even for North Korean refugees who are in China or able to make it to China, 
it's become much more difficult and much more expensive to travel through China. And typically the route has been to get out of China into Southeast Asia. And then from Southeast Asian countries, people can be processed and resettle in South Korea or the United States um, or potentially elsewhere. So it's the, the numbers of refugees making it all the way um, really dropped off uh, since 2020. Now in that, you know, in, in 2023, um, we are hopeful that things will kind of start ticking up a little bit. The conditions in China have changed. Things have opened up a little bit. There's, there's fewer restrictions. It's still very expensive and things are, you know, in a lot of flux. Um, but that's, you know, that's one way that people are, are able to come through. It's a very long journey, about 3,000 miles. People have to try and drive border guards or pay people smugglers who are able to, you know, open up a route for them to get from North Korea across the river into China. And then in China, as a North Korean refugee with, you know, no papers, no ID, um, you know, not being able to show QR codes for, you know, pandemic related stuff, not speaking Chinese, it's extremely difficult, almost impossible to make that journey without some kind of help. And so that's where organizations like our organization, Limited in North Korea, comes in and other people who are helping North Korean refugees, you know, in that kind of humanitarian way to come through to avoid uh, detection and arrest by the Chinese authorities and be able to come all the way through into Southeast Asia. There are some other people that will pay brokers, um, you know, defection brokers, if you like. Uh, some, you know, people smugglers uh, who will take thousands of dollars these days, even tens of thousands of dollars to bring a North Korean person all the way through. And so that basically requires having family in South Korea who are able to raise a lot of capital to try and bring one more family uh, member through China and, and Southeast Asia. The other thing, the other way is directly from North Korea to South Korea. But, um, you know, this is almost like action movie stuff. It's, it's extremely rare. It's extremely dangerous. There are occasionally frontline North Korean soldiers who are looking at South Korea. And sometimes, you know, they, they can see the bright lights of South Korea across the mountains on the other side. And occasionally these people will desert their posts and risk being shot by their own side. Because if somebody defects from North Korea, they will be shot um, and risks, you know, going through the minefields and all of the, you know, it's, it's the most heavily militarized border in the world, right? So it's, even if you're a frontline soldier, it's not easy to get across there. Sometimes people will do that. And then very occasionally, but it's, it's more difficult than people might imagine um, coming along the coast and coming along the sea on the East Sea or the West Sea. Um, there have been people that have swum it. It's kind of, you know, kind of superhuman. And on average, most North Koreans are, are not strong swimmers. Um, and there are people who have been able to come in small boats. But that's a that's a small fraction, actually, of the North Koreans that make it to South Korea. Most people go north into China. And then, uh, you know, this very long, circuitous route to South Korea. I've swam in that water, both on the west and eastern side of that country, and I will say it is not for the faint of heart, for sure. Uh, so let's say a refugee passes through China in their attempt to make it to Southeast Asia. If they happen to be caught while in China, what is the Chinese response to that? So unfortunately, despite you know uh, protestations by the South Korean government and the U.S. government and you know other members of the international community, the Chinese government does not allow protection for North Korean refugees. Uh, they see North Koreans who have crossed into the country as quote unquote, you know, illegal economic migrants. And they have a relationship with the North Korean government, of course, and their agreement is that they will arrest, detain, and forcibly repatriate these people to North Korea and even hand over information about these people in terms of the conditions of of their arrest, um, and you know the the you know suspected crimes or anything like that, which is then used by the North Korean authorities 
in their investigation, which involves torture uh, of people who are forcibly repatriated. And, you know, the, they will then suffer a range of punishments, um, including, you know, potentially being sent to a political prison camp, forced labor, um, and, and, and places where, you know, it, it can be hard for people to come out alive. Um, and so it's a, it's an extremely grave risk. You know, North Korean refugees consistently say that they knew they were putting their lives on the line to try and leave the country and find a to start for it. Um, and some people will even uh, take things that they may use to take their own lives if things go badly, um, if they were caught, uh, you know, because they, they may see, see that as actually better than being detained and sent back to North Korea. Um, um, it's, it's not impossible for the Chinese authorities to show some leniency. Um, and there have been North Korean refugees who have been able to come out of even being arrested by the Chinese police. Um, but of course, you know, we would want to see so much more of that. We want to see, um, a more kind of humanitarian stance by the Chinese authorities, uh, that they would allow more North Korean refugees and in, in more circumstances to not be forcibly repatriated back to North Korea. Yeah. You know, in addition to those risks, um, human beings, man, we can be, uh, some, probably the most vile and terrible species on planet earth reading up uh before talking to you you know there's the risks of being rolled up by the chinese government the physical risks of making that journey and then an estimated 60 percent of women who escape north korea are sold into sex trafficking um can you talk about that a little bit i mean that's that's an, an additional layer on top of everything that we've already discussed yeah you're right and um and in fact, we see that in the numbers of North Koreans who come to South Korea as well, where more than 70% of North Korean refugees who make it to South Korea are, are female. You know, you if you're a North Korean refugee who comes to South Korea, you're likely to be a young North Korean woman, basically, in your 20s or 30s. And one of the reasons for that, it's not, it's not all always the case, and there are thankfully a lot of North Korean refugees and North Korean women who are able to escape, you know, those kind of risks. But um, unfortunately, there is a very high risk of being sex trafficked uh, in China. And sometimes it starts even in North Korea. Um, people may be enticed uh, with the offer of a better life in China you know, the offer of, you know, being able to go to China and make money and then get smuggled across into China. And then they find out that actually they're being trafficked, they're being sold, and they may be sold into a forced marriage. Um, and there is, unfortunately, still very high demand for, quote-unquote, marriageable women in especially Northeast China and you know, rural areas there where there's a you know, there's a, a large uh, kind of male-female disparity. Yeah. Um, and so families will buy a North Korean bride. Um, and, you know, North Korean women who have gone through this, it's it's just shocking. You know, they, they're like, they, they know that they're being treated completely as an object here. And they're being literally auctioned off to the highest bidder. Um, and that might happen multiple times. You know, somebody may be sold to one man and then resold on to another man. Um, and, you know, in, in those circumstances, of course, they may be very vulnerable to various forms of abuse, rape. Um, they often have children there. Those children then also suffer some of the consequences because their mother is not a, a legal person in China. And so it can be difficult to register the child um, on, on the family registry system. And so they may then suffer, you know, more more hardship, you know, getting access to going to school and hospitals and these kind of things. And also, you know, some North Korean women, if they're not sold to uh, Chinese men as kind of forced sold brides, they can be sold into or forced into the sex industry. 
um, where there's also a phenomenon of North Korean women basically being locked in apartments in China and forced to perform, you know, uh, for kind of online, you know, webcam pornography type stuff. Um, and North Korean women may spend years as these kind of, you know, you could say digital sex slaves, right? Um, being completely controlled by pimps. And uh, there have been cases of North Korean women escaping through the windows of these apartments, you know, which are often very high story apartments, right? And, um, you know, potentially making it out, but potentially, you know, obviously very dangerous and, and, and there can be very disastrous consequences to that. Assuming that somebody begins this 3,000 mile journey and they don't fall into or the pitfalls along the way, of which there seems to be many and very diverse. And like I said, it, it never ceases to amaze me how poorly human beings can treat another human being. Assuming the journey goes well, and I'll use air quotes for well, how long would it normally take? So if things went as well as possible, then you could leave North Korea, um, get picked up on the Chinese side of the border, and uh, travel through uh, into, and get out of China into Southeast Asia within a couple of weeks, um, maybe even around a week. Right. This is like if you're if you're just flying through, if you know you're taking like um, relatively fast modes of transport over land. Of course, you're not taking planes, um, and and just you know nonstop. China is a big country. Um, it's a little bit like going from one side of America to to the other coast, right? Um, but you could potentially make it in that kind of time, and then in Southeast Asia potentially fairly quickly uh, through Southeast Asia to the point where you would start your processing. And then within around a month, you could be in South Korea. So the shortest defection time through that kind of route, you may be looking at around six weeks. Then you're in South Korea, you're, you know, you're going to be in the protection of the South Korean government. Um, and in fact, you don't have freedom straight away in South Korea. Uh, the South Korean government kind of sits on people for around six months. Um, and that, and partially they're, they're debriefing, they're investigating people. Um, the South Korean intelligence service is involved. Mm -hmm. And then the South Korean Ministry of Unification is also involved in trying to provide some kind of education uh, for people and, uh, you know, training and provide some services before they start their new lives and What's the longest amount of time you ever heard that journey taking? Um, I know people who left North Korea in the late 1990s and only made it to South Korea in the last few years. So more than 20 years, most of somebody's life. Um, and that's, of course, in the case of a North Korean woman would be sold into uh, a Chinese family and living a very simple and constrained life in rural Northeast China, um, not knowing, not having, you know, a way of getting out of that. Um, and then eventually being able to make a connection with somebody who's actually able to help them to get out of that situation. So a, a, a 20 year gap in between leaving North Korea and being able to actually come to a country where they can live just, you know, safely and freely and actually, uh, you know, live full lives and, and be able to pursue their uh, ambitions and their potential. How does liberty in North Korea help with these individuals who desire to leave North Korea? As an organization, we don't go into North Korea. We don't, you know, go and pull people out of North Korea. But if there are North Koreans who want to leave and are able to come out into China, uh, or if they're already in China, again, in the case of some of these people, they may have been there for years, maybe even decades. If we're able to locate these people, we're able to get um, uh, 
and you know connect with these people then we will bring them into our network uh, where we have you know a lot of partners on the ground a lot we're using a lot of different modes of transport and different routes and these routes are often changing where obviously there's a uh we have to operate under the radar of the Chinese authorities and, and you know we're having to smuggle people through it's obviously people who want to be smuggled but it is kind of people smuggling and uh we're we're just trying to help as many people to come through that need that help as possible um and a lot of the time it is uh cases of other North Koreans that we know who may have resettled in South Korea who know somebody in that situation. It may be their family member. It may be somebody that they knew when they were in China. Um, there are different ways that people get referred into our network. We also have uh, contacts and partners on the ground who are able to identify people that may not know anybody in South Korea and, and they become a North Korean refugee and then we try and, we try and bring them through. And so to date, you know, this is, I think, part of our work that I'm most thankful for, that so many North Korean people have trusted us when we've, you know, reached out and at maybe their most dangerous and vulnerable time in their life. And they don't know us. You know, they don't know where we're coming from. They don't know why we would be helping them. Uh, it's going to be It's going to be hard to trust. It's also, you know, when we say this is not going to cost you anything because there are other, other people paying for it. There are, uh, you know, we have supporters around the world that want to help people like you in this situation. That's difficult to understand for a North Korean refugee. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's like, come on, like you're not getting anything out of this. Like I don't need to pay you back. Like why, why, why how does that work? Um, but you know, thankfully, we've been able to help uh, to date more than 1,200 North Korean refugees who have become refugees and uh, come all the way to South Korea and also to the United States. I feel like the North Korean government and the Chinese government is likely aware of your organization and they're not your number one fan. I'm curious if there are risks associated with people working directly with your organization from either of those entities. Yeah, you're right. We don't get. Um, we probably don't get Christmas yeah. cards. Yeah, we don't, we don't get the cards. <laughs> um, I don't think we ever did uh, from the North Korean or Chinese authorities. Um, there, there can be a risk. I think that the biggest risk, of course, is to North Korean refugees themselves and to people who are operating in China to assist North Korean refugees, or maybe to. You know, people who are involved in other operations, including, for instance, to try and get more information, media, technology, and so on into North Korea. These are the people who are on the front lines in the field who are taking the big risk. In terms of physical safety, it's, I think, much better, apart from maybe for the highest profile North Korean defectors uh, and the people that, you know, the North Korean government may see as a as a as a big risk because they they've shown that they will they will assassinate people outside of their country um, and they will make make attempts on uh, defectors as well. Um, I I feel safer than that to be honest. I, I don't think that my head is above the parapet as much as other people. Mr. Park, what would you like to leave the viewers and listeners with? I will let you close this out with whatever you would like to. Uh close this out with? You know, I, I think it's just that we should remember the North Korean people. Uh, I think that North Korea, sometimes it's in the news and it pops up as something about Kim Jong-un or something about missiles. But there's 25 million North Korean people and uh, they live in the most closed and repressive country in the world. And uh, I think that with everything else that's going on around the world, if anything these people are becoming more forgotten than before. Uh, and so when we see Kim Jong-un, when we see missiles, let's remember the 25 million North Korean people who are people just like us, 
um, who are hidden behind every image of a North Korean missile. And uh, if people are interested to try and learn more actually about the lives of North Korean people from North Korean people, right? Read a book written by a North Korean person, watch YouTube videos made by or with North Korean people. Um, there's increasingly content which is being produced by North Korean refugees about their own country that we can learn so much from. And then if people are moved, you know, uh, stand up as an ally of North Korean people. Find an organization that you like that works on this cause and, and donate to it. Support, volunteer, um, you know, lobby your uh, elected representatives to do something about this issue. Because for so long, so few people have done anything about North Korea and for North Korean people. It's a perfect ending. I can't thank you enough for your time. It, uh, yeah, it's a tough subject matter for sure. It's, you know, you go about your daily life and forget that there are, <laughs> again, you have no, we have so much and so much access to information and so much freedom of movement that it's almost hard to imagine or even fathom the exact opposite of that. And, it, you know, there's a, like you said, you know, 24,999,999 people other than Kim Jong un who are dealing with that. You can learn more about Sokil and his work with Liberty in North Korea and how you can help by visiting libertyinnorthkorea.org. The website again is libertyinnorthkorea.org. 